Okay, great. Here we go. <laughs> we are definitely recording at this point because it told us. Okay, sorry. No problem. Um, so hello to all the folks who are in the future. Um, I'm Wes Modes, and I'm gonna get this show started. Or die trying. Um, so, yep, let's first talk about boats uh, or things humans build, particularly boats. Uh, this is literally one of our oldest technologies. Um, when I'm in a classroom and talking about this, I always ask students to guess like how old they think you know, boating, right? Like boats, how, how long has that been around? Some people guess, I don't know, like 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 years maybe on the outer edge. Turns out um, humans have used boats to make extraordinary journeys since prehistoric times, more than a million years of human boat building. So um, ancient boats have been recovered that were 40,000 years old from Australia. Uh, 130,000 years old from Crete, and even 900,000 years old from Indonesia. So to put that in perspective, uh, 998,000 years before the events in the Bible, people were traveling between continents on watercraft. So um, Mesopotamia and Indus Valley people. So if you're, you're familiar with Mesopotamia, um, modern day Iraq, uh, and the Indus Valley is the coastal area. The Indus civilization was along the coast of India, sort of facing the Arabian Sea. They had complex transcontinental commerce uh, well back into prehistory. So um, that means that people were exchanging goods and, and stuff like uh, front and people from going back, you know. Uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, this, by the way, is an Uru, a free freeform boat. Uh, it's usually of teak, and it's built in southern India, and it's been built for um, millennia, and it can carry about 400 tons of cargo, just to kind of challenge what you may think about prehistoric people and uh, everything you learned about prehistoric people from that historic document, the far side. Um, People have been living on the water for much of human history, perhaps starting in the Tigris Euphrates marshland. Um, you're familiar with the Marsh Arabs. Um, here in the US, uh, getting super much more contemporary, um, from the 18th century on, people lived on rivers all over the continent. So uh, this, you could call this a shanty boat. What I'm in, I call it a shanty boat. It's a small crude houseboat, usually built from whatever materials were at hand. Uh, also called a boathouse or a flat boat or a broadhorn, barge, scow, or ark. There's a long forgotten history uh, in America of people living in homemade shanty boats. It's a, it was definitely a, a low cost solution for um, people in rural areas, for workers in urban areas, for um, uh, freed enslaved people. Uh, we'll talk more about like the socioeconomics of people who live in, have lived in shanty boats in America. Um, early travelers on American rivers moved goods by flatboat. So here's an example of a flatboat. Um, and honestly, it's not much different from the design of my boat. Maybe I'm using a bit more updated materials. So if you lived in, you know, northern Wisconsin and, uh, um, or, you know, uh, in the depths of like Ohio or something, and you raised pigs or um, cut timber or, you know, made molasses or, or uh, maple syrup or whatever, you would take those goods, the best price you can get for them is down in New Orleans. So you'd build a flat boat, you'd take your goods, maybe with uh, other neighbors, and you would you'd build a flat boat, and you would put the goods aboard and you would float it down to New Orleans using those big, uh, those things that look like oars, they're called sweeps, to control the boat um, as you went down to New Orleans. And there you'd get a really good price. You'd sell the boat for timber, it'd be used for wood, and then you'd buy a mule and you'd walk back up to Ohio or Wisconsin and then you'd do it again the next year. So um, shanty boats, 
uh, for the most part, however, were homes on the water and they didn't travel much, uh, usually made from scrap material found on or near the river. And then more than a century, um, shanty boat communities and shanty communities have sprung up in industrial towns and out of the way rural areas everywhere on the continent. So these are places for itinerant workers, miners, fishermen, shipbuilders, displaced farmers, um, people who would uh, in the parlance of today be homeless or houseless. Um, and uh, this is in Minneapolis on the flats. Uh, poor people, new immigrants, they found space, right? Right at the edge of town. Um, and they built shanty towns and thriving communities in those bottomlands uh, where it typically flooded annually. So a lot of those houses are two-story houses or they have attics. And then in the spring, they would often move all their possessions up to the upper floor where they would not be damaged. Uh, there were communities, um, thriving shanty boat communities in Minneapolis, Knott'sville, Cincinnati, Louisville, Portland, um, all over the continent. Uh, numerous towns on the Mississippi River, Ohio, Tennessee, um, down in the swamps of Louisiana, Texas, Florida. Um, the East Coast uh, had shanty boats in many of the bays um, along the uh, intercoastal what's now the intercoastal waterway. Um, the West Coast even, like Portland and Seattle had big shanty boat communities, rivers, lakes, waterways, all over the continent. Um, I think for me, probably the most surprising thing is that this is a history uh, that's not well known in America. We have all sorts of ways that we have popularly um, recorded uh, American history. This just isn't one that like made the dominant historical narrative. Um, a few people, uh, or a few families made epic shanty boat voyages on major rivers, and um, some wrote about that, and uh, we have some of those chronicles passed down to us. Uh, there were whole families moving from place to place where there was better work or better weather. Um, typically, these were mostly tied to the economic conditions, um, the, the uh, panic of 1890 or the depression of the 1930s or after the World War I when there was a depression or the 1970s even, um, the inevitable boom and bust cycles of capitalism. Uh, but let's look at artists, um, and I'll take you back a couple hundred years. Um, artists have long been inspired by water and boats, of course, um, and then tracing the long history of artists and boats is itself a fascinating topic. Does anybody know this person, this artist? Mid-19th century, Charles Francois de Bigny, right? One of the important influences to the Impressionists. He painted from his boat, uh, Le Bouton, on the Seine and the Hoes River in France. Uh, de Bigny created an impressive collection of drawings of his studio houseboat, Le Bouton. Uh, he documented painting with his paintings and sketches, um, not only the view from his boat, but even the process of outfitting and moving his studio into Le Bouton. So there's pictures of him and I guess his kids or neighboring kids like hauling wagons full of stuff to his studio. Uh, a decade later um, in the Impressionist era, Claude Monet moved from London to uh, Argentui uh, in France along the River Seine. So he was inspired by boats he saw in Holland and by de Bigny. Uh, he sought a riverboat he could use uh, for a floating studio. And so he found an old fishing boat and had a wooden cabin built, uh, barely big enough for a single easel. And for several years, he plied back and forth uh, along the Seine um, to paint scenes of uh, such, you know, uh, bucolic things as uh, water lilies and such. Now we're getting a little closer to home, right? Uh, in the 1890s, uh, self-taught artist and uh, Ornithologist uh, Gerard Hardenberg, um, living in New Brunswick um, and spending his time painting at the Jersey Shore. Um, perhaps inspired by Monet and uh, other painters, and certainly by the shanty boats that he would have found um, at the time uh, on almost every waterway in America, he purchased an old houseboat 
uh, the dumpling is what it was originally called here um, in Bayhead, New Jersey. And uh, Hardenberg outfitted it as his mobile studio and rechristened it uh, a much more dignified name, the Pelican. And from its mooring in Scow Ditch in Bayhead, he explored the wetlands and the bird life of uh, Bernargat Bay. So from Pelican, uh, Hardenberg painted and sketched native birds, landscapes, marshlands, and sites along the shore of the bay. Uh, in the winter, he lived in New Brunswick, and during the summers, he lived and painted uh, on Pelican until his marriage in 1906. So he was, uh, he spent a good, good amount of time in his shanty boat uh, along the bay. So I want to thank uh, art historian uh, Pat Burke um, for the information on Gerard Hardenberg that we used here. In the 1940s, uh, another artist, um, so this is uh, fast forwarding kind of toward the end of the shantyboat era, uh, and this was a, a gentleman named Harlan Hubbard who grew up, um, you know, not listening to his parents and hanging out with all the, uh, with the shantyboaters, the disreputable shantyboaters along the Ohio River. Um, he and his, he got married and his wife, Anna, uh, he told her about his, his dreams of building a shanty boat and sail and floating down the Ohio river to the, to the Mississippi. And she said like, well, when are you going to do it? When are you going to like fulfill your dreams? And so together they built a shanty boat along the banks of the Ohio river, north of Cincinnati. And they floated over five years down the Ohio, um, spending summer, they floated in the, generally in the spring floods, and then um, they would summer out in some nice place and they'd grow a garden and they had bees that they kept uh, on their shanty boat. Um, and they would, you know, live in their shanty boat along some beautiful uh, holler somewhere, and then they would float next, the next spring. So they went out into the, uh, down the Mississippi, all the way to New Orleans, and then out into the bayous of Louisiana um, before eventually making their way back uh, and creating a homestead along the banks of the Ohio in Trimble County, um, Kentucky. So with their educations, their passion for reading and classical music, they played, uh, he played, gosh, I don't know what he played. I think he played the fiddle. And um, Anna played uh, cello. And so they would play music every night. Anna and Harlan were definitely atypical shanty boaters. Um, Harlan's writings still to this day uh, inspire uh, generations to live simply and efficiently. So if you're a fan of Thoreau, who spent, is it two summers? He spent two summers out at Walden Pond, <laughs> where his mom would come and uh, get his laundry and bring him sandwiches. Um, Anna and Harlan were like the real deal. And uh, they, his writings uh, really reflect, he was also a fan of Thoreau's in fairness. So um, still inspire people like me uh, to, um, uh, we'll exaggerate a little and say live a shanty boat life, right? I'm, I'm at home in my little cabin in the mountains right now. Um, but uh, Anna and Harlan Hubbard are something. So during our journeys on the river in our shanty boat, we saw both houseboats and boat houses. And here's a little river vocabulary. Uh, a houseboat, like the one I'm in, is mostly a boat that you can live on. It generally, they have their own power, though obviously earlier they would use sweeps or, or oars. Um, a boathouse, uh, especially if you're up in Wisconsin or Minnesota or Northern Iowa, uh, it's a it's a mostly a house that happens to float on the water. Originally, these started as like boat garages, and somebody would build on a little room so they can stay down there when they are at the at the cabin, where I'm sure it was a lot cooler in the summer. Um, and then some of these, a lot of these still exist, and uh, so it's fun to go and visit these and check out these little boat houses in. The northern Miss in on the upper Mississippi. There's only a, really a few places in the entire country where boathouses are still allowed on inland waterways. Um, we got a chance to visit 
uh, a bunch on the Mississippi River. Um, we saw boathouse communities in Wisconsin, Minnesota, in Iowa. Um, we heard from folks on the Tennessee that just a generation ago, there were shanty boats and houseboats and boathouses on the river. And well, though it's part of the American landscape since at least the 19th century, uh, with the exception of a handful of uh, travel memoirs, and pulp fiction, there's very little written about shantyboat communities. So uh, the shantyboat girl, their searing affair set the whole town on fire from the dreary shantyboat world to the gilded mansions on the hill. No, I don't really think of uh, a shantyboat uh, as being dreary at all. Um, but um, I guess if the, all the disreputable folks live down at the water, the bootleggers and, um, and uh, uh, prostitutes and, and um, you know, fishermen and trappers and whatnot, maybe it seemed dreary, but if you, if you lived in a gilded mansion. So I want to tell a little bit about my background. Um, uh, I told Debbie that uh, I lay responsibility for how my life has turned out uh, squarely at the feet of my fifth grade librarian, who, when I asked for a book, gave me three, um, Huck Finn, uh, of course, and Contiki by Thor Heyerdahl, and Never Cry Wolf by Farley Mowat. Um, and uh, my life has been forever altered. Uh, you know, it's hard not to read Huck Finn and think, hey, why can't I do that? And that's exactly what I thought. Um, so uh, as uh, Debbie mentioned, uh, I hopped freight trains through the 90s and early 2000s, mostly as a way of getting around and seeing the world. I wanted to travel, but I was poor, I was a student. And so um, that was my way of just kind of being able to see the world for on the cheap. And um, it around 2005, I discovered that there were punk kids who had been building and scavenging uh, broken boats and floating down the Mississippi River from Minneapolis down to New Orleans. And I was really inspired. So I missed that trip, but I set out on a punk, my own punk rafting journey, um, driving cross country and building a raft out of found and scavenged materials and floating on one of the largest, fastest rivers on the continent, the Missouri. So here's one of our punk rafts. It's built of truck inner tubes and dumpster plywood. So we lived to tell the tale, uh, barely. We had some close grapes. And I think if we had known how dangerous it was, maybe we wouldn't have done it. I don't know, maybe. Um, and so year after year, we took longer and longer adventures, uh, floating many major American rivers on these ridiculous homemade rafts. Um, after that first trip, we invited others and we launched whole punk raft flotillas. And on one trip, we had a dozen rafts, 20 punks and two dogs floating down the Willamette River in Oregon. This is not our raft. This raft is very <laughs> disordered and messy, but you can definitely get a sense of like, there's a car seat and like a kid's chair and it was just made of whatever we found. Uh, we discovered we were doing something really extraordinary, not just because of our strange crafts, but for our use of the river. Um, most of the towns that we encountered had turned away from the river. Um, we had the expectation that we would float down the river and there'd be people, you know, maybe a la deliverance um, sitting on their porches and playing banjo and giving, you know, hollering down to us. But uh, by and large, um, these were rivers that uh, were overlooked, uh, so forgotten that the people in the towns where, where we traveled argued with us about where the river went, where it came from, and even whether it was navigable and even what direction it flowed. So we wanted to find out more about these regions to which we traveled. Um, I loved our little homemade boats. Uh, we made them really comfortable. You know, we often got like a thrift store couch and they had carpet and were super comfy for the two weeks we were on the river. But it always broke my heart at the end of the trip um, to 
break up our little boats and deflate our inner tubes for next year. Um, so in 2012, they began building uh, the shanty boat I'm in now, the Dottie. Uh, it's a traditional wood, wooden hulled barge bottom houseboat. Pretty similar in design to those built in the early 20th century, albeit with more um, updated materials. Uh, it was built completely from scratch out of mostly recycled materials. Um, we, uh, in, this, in this image, we are disassembling an abandoned chicken coop that became the cabin for the boat. A uh, community of friends helped um, at every phase of this project. Here where I built the hull upside down um, as one does and everybody's flipping it upright. It took shape over about two years working weekends and vacations. Uh, it was a, a great um, escape from my day job. And so to this day, we're always improving, refining and repairing the shanty boat. Um, about that time, uh, a production company heard about my shanty boat blog and they were trying to woo me to do a reality TV show. They were calling shanty boat men, <laughs> which I just thought was one super hilarious because it's gonna alienate at least half their audience, including all the awesome ladies I knew who were more hardcore boaters than I was. Um, and they were like bad boyfriends, right? They would leave me hanging for months and then they'd call me up saying like, hey babe, the higher ups love you. You've always been our favorite. Um, and then about a year of back and forth and they must've found some other bright shiny thing. Um, they kind of moved on to other projects. But even now, like every few months, uh, we get an email from some production company wanting to create a, some unscripted production. But in reality, the project is kind of the antithesis of television and I'm not sure television is ready for it. Long form, quiet, steady, focused on listening rather than talking and dealing with completely ordinary people. Um, so it might be a while before TV is able to embrace what we're doing. Um, in designing the project, I worked carefully to combine my interest in people's stories, people's history, as well as my passion for art, social engagement, digital and new media work and DIY adventure. So um, this is my answer to the production worlds of LA and New York, this project full of honest, meaningful, sincere stories. Uh, in the run-up to the expedition, the very first expedition in 2014, there were tons of preparation, finishing the boat, fundraising, and so on. Um, we had just enough time to say goodbye to all the friends who helped with the boat. Um, uh, we towed the boat in an epic cross-country journey. We we're headed to Minneapolis to launch on the Mississippi River, the archetypal uh, journey um, in American riverdom, right? Um, and then shipmates who've joined me on this part of the journey uh, uh, agreed the road trip was by far the most perilous part of the expedition. You know, if we have a problem on the river, maybe we sink and we have to swim to shore, but there's not much chance of dying in a flaming, tumbling wreck at 60 miles an hour. Um, on the way to that first expedition, we went through two trucks, one transmission, one radiator, a couple batteries, and various parts that fell off the shanty boat. Uh, people asked us all the, you know, as we were readying the boat for that first launch, um, you're going to test the boat, right? And I said, we said, well, of course, like that'd be irresponsible. We will totally test the boat if we have the time. And we just didn't really have the time to see if the boat <laughs> floated. So we traveled across the country and dropped our completely untested boat into one of the largest rivers on the continent. So spoiler alert, it didn't sink, we didn't drown, and we set off from Minneapolis on the Great Muddy on the Mississippi River. So this project, uh, the Secret History Project, is um, the secret history of American River people. Uh, the intention is to build a collection of personal stories of people who live and work on the river from the deck of a recreated mid-century shanty boat over a series of epic river voyages. That's my elevator pitch. Um, so the project engages people living in contemporary river communities um, in dialogue, examining those personal stories of ordinary river people, 
uh, in the ways that river communities respond to threats to river culture, such as gentrification, uh, economic displacement, uh, environmental degradation, and the effects of global climate change. We make our way downriver in this rustic houseboat. Um, we, uh, people tell us that traveling on the river is, and, and taking the time to listen to people's stories is what makes the project unique. And then our hope is always that it inspires wonder and connects meaning, meaningfully with people's personal histories. Hopefully, um, we hope to like, encourage an awareness of the issues facing those communities um, and the long history of people who've lived on and adjacent to the river and a basic understanding of river ecology. Um, increasingly, I've come to understand the economic and political dimensions of river history and how it affects river culture. The project itself centers on a growing collection of personal narratives of people who live in river communities. So there's a good bit of research uh, done to understand the natural ecology of American rivers, but there's less done, there's very little work done around the social ecology of river communities. We're entering our seventh year of the project. Uh, the shanty boat, the shanty boat Dottie that I'm in has traveled over 2,500 river miles and 26,000 miles by land. We've conducted 175 oral history interviews, um, usually spanning half an hour to three hours. Um, it's hundreds of hours of video and audio exhibited nationwide, and we've talked to thousands of people about the river. Um, I particularly seek out the invisible stories of non-privileged populations, uh, native people, working class folk, people of color, and women. Um, after eight months on the river, uh, eight total months, right? Six years, seven years of field work. I've gathered thousands of photos, hundreds of documents, and um, all those interviews. Uh, the project itself is particularly inspired by the great work of Studs Terkel, um, who gathered uh, the thoughts and feelings of ordinary people on a variety of subjects in his book, Working, and a couple others. Uh, it also recalls the work of artist Suzanne Lacey, um, and the community-based work of Helen and Newton Harrison. And there are a whole slew of contemporary artists who are working uh, wa a water-based practice, Mary Mattingly, Eve Mosher, and some others. Um, in the humanities, it recalls the work of social documentarians uh, that you know, Walker Evans, Alan Lomax, and, Howard, and the people's history of Howard Zinn. So my goal, is to create a multi-perspective and multi-path take on historical narrative to explore the importance of what we consider the public commons and also to kind of challenge dominant cultural assumptions about the role in society of people living at the edges. Outcomes of the project include uh, a very extensive blog, a research archive, um, short and feature documentaries and a series of books. Um, and then these archives telling otherwise untold personal narratives um, are a cultural artifact. And I hope it has wide reaching significance to people living and searching for solutions to shared challenges in communities elsewhere on the continent. In general, I hope that the project like steps into the past to bring something forward to inform our present and our thoughts about uh, the fringes and our own forgotten histories. Okay, so let's look at some of the journeys we've made and the boat itself. So the shanty boat's small, but livable. It's 20 foot long and eight foot wide. Um, the cabin is 10 by eight, so I can almost reach across from end from side to side. Uh, we outfitted it with everything we could imagine we'd need to live comfortably. So we have all the amenities one could want, a full kitchen, uh, a work table, lots of light and breeze, a comfy couch. Up above me, there's a sleeping loft and there's a well-stocked project library of river memoirs, reference books and trashy reading like Shanty Boat Girl, which we've read, it's not very good. 
salacious. Um, everything we can need. Uh, this is the head. It also doubles as our art gallery where we hang all the art that people send us. Do you see that sign on the, <laughs> on the door? Pooping 101. So we've been through 50 locks, including some of the biggest in the world. Uh, this is a lock on the Tennessee River. It's 80 feet deep. I don't even think we're at the bottom at this point. Uh, including, uh, so people ask us all the time, um, aren't you afraid of the big barges and the locks? And our experience is that tug captains and lock masters are seriously the most professional people on the river. Um, they always treat us with respect. Uh, in the towns to which we travel, um, the people we meet are super generous and helpful. Um, one couple read about us in the local press and adopted us and became our trip angels, um, meeting us at towns downriver. One woman, Joe, brought us literally a wheelbarrow full of beer and, so, and drinks. So we make slow and steady progress, stopping at big and little towns along the way. We're constantly overwhelmed by the generosity of strangers. We come into town, right? And we're asking people, we're asking them to participate in the project, to share their stories and their lives and, and take time out of their busy lives. And though, even though we're asking so much from them, uh, people bring us gifts when they come to interview. Someone explained to me, when you come here and you're interested in our histories, that you make time to truly listen to our stories. That is the gift. People have brought us, here's the list, right? Fresh homegrown cucumbers, zucchinis, tomatoes, nectarines, peaches, plums, greens, sweet, fresh sweet corn, apples, tomatillos, peppers, basil, and cabbage. Uh, they've baked us loaves of amazing country bread, uh, cookies, shortbread, pies. Um, they've brought us beer. They've brought us history books and articles and photos and postcards for the archive. And they've They've definitely brought us like family photos and films. They've brought us rocks and shells. And more, most importantly, of course, people have brought their personal stories. I'm pretty sure that Mark Twain had a slightly different experience on the river. Um, throughout the trip, I'm blogging, tweeting to followers, um, processing interviews, making arrangements for new interviews. A lot of my time is spent um, interviewing for the Secret History Archive. Um, sometimes I schedule people I know I've, I've met online far ahead of time. Other times I meet people randomly. Uh, during field work, um, again, I try to seek out those stories of people who do not normally, who are not normally represented in the dominant historical archive. So I've, tried, I've interviewed adventurers and shanty boaters and scientists and historians and artists and people living under bridges and others who have a relationship with the river. So there are interviews in the oral history tradition and they capture a variety of people's thoughts about and their feelings about the river, their work, their lives, their childhoods on the water, uh, issues faced by river communities and the stories about the river itself. Uh, but what have I learned, right? Like all this time on the river, uh, a lot, but it's a, it's a miscellany. It takes, um, it has only slowly after five, six, seven years started to congeal into something that I hear repeated themes throughout my story, throughout my travels. Uh, I've tried to know the river through listening and in listening, I've gathered this strange assortment of river wisdom. Um, I've talked to people who've lived within sight of the river every day of their lives. Uh, I've gotten a taste of river life and I continue to be humbled by the knowledge of the people that I meet on the river for six, seven, eight or more decades. Uh, through these stories told by these folks, um, certain themes emerge. Um, I've always felt a little insecure that I didn't have stronger themes um, originally going into field work. Uh, but I've, as I've learned, as I've like leaned into this idea of listening as a form of art practice, I've also grown more comfortable with allowing these therm themes to emerge organically from the hundreds of conversations I've had with river folk. And then these received themes are of course subjective and are filtered by my own point of view, but I'm also increasingly comfortable with that as well. 
So one thing, one theme that continues to emerge is that rivers are an actively contested landscape. Conflicts between industry and ecology, between capital and community, between economic redevelopment and cultural preservation are often in tension, and between white communities and communities of color. Uh, they are man these conflicts are manifest at the riverside. Um, thanks to the benefits of the Clean Water Act of 1972, uh, the river is clearer than it has been in 150 years. Um, and we have seen even within uh, our, our time that in, the, in our current political climate, um, those regulations that cleaned up our waterways are under attack. Uh, thanks to lingering organic and chemical pollution, habitat change from the lock and dam system and overfishing, many fish populations have nearly collapsed, right? Or have found or faced a lot of serious competition from more successful invasive species. Um, and so there's hope that the fisheries with the, um, you know, water protection regulation that fisheries will make a comeback. Um, I've learned that river authorities like the Army Corps of Engineers uh, are tasked with this, ex this contradictory mandate. It's uh, of river conservation and river navigation. Uh, so it's kind of a schizophrenic dichotomy that re has resulted in both the lock and dam system, but it's simultaneously silting in all the backwaters on all the large rivers, eroding islands and shorelines and destroying native habitat. Um, people born in the first half of the 20th century remember a river that was awash in oil and chemicals and choked with organic waste, uh, literally an open sewer um, from uh, cities dumping their sewage into the river. And um, while the wealthy and industrial barian, barons set up their ho homes high on the hills um, in river towns away from the stench of the river, down at the riverside, that was the place uh, where communities of immigrants, poor, working class, black and brown people formed. So these people either worked in river-based industry or subsisted on what they could fish, grow or scavenge. And then these waterfront communities are always the first that are threatened to make way for flood control and urban redevelopment. I met a woman who sat with me beside the Tennessee River and pointed at the lake made by the uh, by the dams of the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and said, my parents' home is right there, pointing at the water. Um, the story of modern river towns is the story of how they responded to big floods in the early part of the 20th century, especially the 1927 flood on the Mississippi, um, resulting in flood walls and whole neighborhoods bulldozed in the floodplain and all the neighborhoods surrounding it um, that were often successful black and brown communities. And in many river towns from the late 40s onward, urban renewal, which sounds really positive, uh, was a program of disruptive economic redevelopment that specifically targeted, we'll put this in quotes, blighted urban areas. Um, older neighborhoods were bulldozed to make way for flood walls, freeways, and riverfront parks. Um, these blighted neighborhoods contained <coughs> irreplaceable historic buildings and primarily housed poor and working class folks who received often inadequate or no compensation for their properties. So decades later, ironically, these flood walls and freeways separate cities from the river to which they owe their existence. This is Albany, the capital of New York, that is on the Hudson River and now can't reach their own river. In Minneapolis, Northeast Minneapolis, which is a primarily African-American community, um, they are two blocks away from the river, but there are two freeways that separate them from the river. So as towns turn their face back toward the river, they often displace people who've lived on the river for generations and destroy historic neighborhoods. Um, the generation, the gentrification of boom times um, can sometimes be as irreparably damaging as hard times. So when we see a gorgeous green river park, we often have to ask, we have to remind ourselves to look deeper than the surface, um, to dig back in time and ask ourselves what and who was displaced to create this. This is um, Hudson, New York. So for communities attempting to re-establish a connection to the river, 
the impulse is often to create a shiny, clean, and sanitized parkland, uh, a kind of a mall, maybe with a run river running through it, rather than a wild natural waterway. So urban rivers are the site of concrete abutments, river walks, aggressive policing, um, and the removal of riparian shrubs and foliage to discourage squatting and other unauthorized uses. So it's, a, it's an enclosure of the historic commons. So this is the San Lorenzo River that runs through Santa Cruz, the closest little town to me, and it's an actively contested space uh, where the solution arrived to, per, uh, to prevent poor people from squatting in the river was to prohibit everyone from experiencing the river. Meanwhile, of course, large development projects move forward to gentrify that riverfront to transform this forgotten resource into a fancy shopping zone. So living, eating, sleeping on the river, months at a time, I've learned a few things on my own. Uh, I know that the boat should always approach a dock from downstream. Uh, I learned that the texture of the water reflects what's going on beneath the waves. Um, one of the surprising epiphanies of the journeys that we've made um, is that the rivers that run through our towns and cities are not incidental to the geography, to our local geography. Our towns and cities are specifically located to take advantage of the river's contributions to transportation, agriculture, the availability of fresh water. We are all river people. So like the river itself, um, uh, river knowledge is both wide and deep. And in my months on the river, uh, I feel sometimes like I've barely gotten beneath the surface of that wisdom. So I want to thank uh, my, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank uh, my host, especially Debbie. Um, and just uh, thank you guys for being here and um, see if you guys have any questions for me. Thank you so much, Wes. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, and we do have questions. So Good. are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So first question was, you had mentioned that it could be dangerous. So why was it dangerous? What was the main part that was dangerous? Um, is this when we were punk, punk boating? Yes. Um, I think the first thing, first, literally the first hour out, uh, we had, <laughs> I had two other raft mates and one of them was terrified, rightfully so, but so terrified that he was catatonic and he refused to give up his paddle because that gave him that took away his control, but at the same time, he also refused to paddle. So like one of the first things that happened is we just boom, hit a navigation buoy and the raft almost went under and all of our stuff was scattered all over the river. For any of you that are familiar, uh, like with kayaking or canoeing, um, that's called colloquially uh, a garage sale. Like when all your stuff is scattered all over the river. Um, so we had a garage sale going down the Missouri River. Uh, that we barely survived. I mean, there are snags in the river, depending on the river, right? Um, there are dangerous currents. Uh, we're pretty safe in the in the dotty. I mean, the dotty could be damaged um, if we hit a rock or hit, uh, you know, ground ourselves too hard on the on rocks or um, hit a snag. But for the most part, we try to stay, if it's a bigger river, we stay in the navigation channel and then we don't have problems. We could also be run over by a barge, right? We could, we could be, and if they didn't see us or even if they saw us, uh, a barge is a lot like a train. There can be up to five barges long and five barges wide, making almost a, a half a mile long. Uh, it's not gonna be able to stop if we got in its way. Um, so those are some of the dangers, but for the most part, we have either lucked out enough while we were ignorant that now we're a bit more <laughs> knowledgeable and don't run into those dangers as much. Uh, next question. Next question. So from Peter Ham, as a paddler who is always looking for new trips, what are some of your favorite rivers? Oh, that's such a good question. The Sacramento is really beautiful because it's really wide. Um, most of the Eastern rivers are really controlled. So um, uh, revetment is a new vocabulary word. Revetment basically means rock or concrete or uh, those like concrete jumping jacks or whatever that are dumped along the edges of the river to control its natural meander. 
um, with the, some of the Western rivers, they put the levees really far out to allow the river to meander at will. Uh, so it still has some wildness to it. So you end up with this corridor where the, the levees in some places are like a mile wide and the river is allowed to have its sandy banks and the places where it erodes these, you know, these uh, big like cliffs where stuff is always kind of falling down. Um, it's a wild river. Uh, I kind of am still fond of the Missouri River because that was our first river. Um, culturally, uh, I was really fond of the Ohio River. People said like, it's gonna be boring. It's an industrial river, but it was a gorgeous river with tons of tiny little towns that were fabulous. Maybe not so beautiful if you're in a kayak because it's a really big river. So it's gonna feel a little uh, monotonous. Um, but those smaller rivers, man, I still have ooh, big hearts for. Uh, great answer. So Jill Berry asks, the Delaware breach today in Pennsylvania due to weather. What did you do in adverse weather while on the rivers? Oh, wow. Good question. Um, people ask us that all the time. Like, what do we do when it rains? Right. Now, if you're a paddler, <laughs> that's like a serious, important question. What do you do when it rains? Uh, what we do when it rains is we have tea. We go and we go inside. And uh, if it's really inclement weather, if it's really blowing, we try to find, um, you know, maybe like the mouth of a creek somewhere and drop, a, drop an anchor or two. And um, we just sit it out. We've sat through incredible wind and rainstorms. And we're blowing around on our anchor and we make tea and we sit out on the porch and we smoke a cigar and watch the rain come down in sheets. Uh, there's probably only been one time when we were genuinely worried about weather and it happened to be on the Tennessee and it was raining so hard in I think Chattanooga maybe um, that there were waves coming up and sloshing the boat sideways while we were docked. We probably would have been better at anchor. Um, and the rain was coming down sideways and our boat's not really meant for that. <laughs> so water was kind of water falling in. Um, you know, we like, that was the only time we've ever like had a plan. Like I'll grab this, you grab that, I'll, then I'll grab the dog and off we, you know, if we have to, but we survived it, so. So from Pamela Benson, you mentioned a few in influential books. Did you ever read My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George? I have not. I will add that to my list. Um, if you look, I believe, if you look on our website, I'll see if I can dredge it up super fast. Um, we have... You can just drop it in the chat too. That would That's be exactly what I'll do. Yeah. Um, list. We have a good reading list of things that we have really loved. So. Yeah, I can share that with everyone um, okay, after with the recording. So that would be great. Um, but yeah, so that's one for your reading list, My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George. Yep, um, and I, I dropped that into the chat. So thank you. Or peruse them. Um, what was your roofing material and did you have trouble during storms with the boat filling up with water? That's, I guess, similar to that. So the roofing material. Um, go ahead and can you give my, can you spotlight my phone? I think so. Let's see if I can. Hold on. Hang so on. the roof. The roofing material that I'm looking at right now in the boat is just um, corrugated iron. Oh, you have to start the video on that one. Okay. Okay. There you go. So, um, can you see it? I'm just going to make sure I spotlight. I'm going to add the spotlight for that. Okay. So, go. everyone should be able to see that now. Okay. So, you're looking up at the roof. Um, so it's made of corrugated tin. And uh, maybe I'll give you guys a little tour later if we have the time. Um, and uh, it's just recycled tin from some, <laughs> from, you know, some source somewhere um, that, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to find. And so that has served us very well over the years. Okay, cool. 
Um, okay, so here, do you need a license for your shanty boat and or to live on the boat? Um, good question. Uh, that's actually a question that, that Debbie asked the same, asked me as well. Um, it's a boat, so it's a vehicle and we have a motor. So it's official and they want us to license it. Um, what I was really surprised about is here in California where it was registered, because that's where I live. Um, the place you do that is just the DMV. And they didn't care about, they didn't care, all they wanted was money, right? So they're like, how much did you buy it for? And I'm like, I don't know, man, I bought a bunch of lumber and put it together. So I like brought a stack of receipts like this, this tall and said like, $5,000, that's what we paid for it. And they're like, all right, boom, pay us this much. And then they gave me a registration. So I just have to, and so I have like boop, 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 a whole number. Um, and that's on the side of the boat. And uh, I don't have a special license for living on it because there's no such thing as like a houseboat license. You're, um, there are limits to how long you can live in a particular place. Like one time we pulled up on a beach and the, the water cops came by and they're like, we just wanted to tell you that there's a limit to how long you can stay here. And we're like, oh, okay, uh, how long is that? And they said, you can only stay here for 41 days. So we're like, Okay, we'll try to keep our two day stay within that 41 day window and we're good. Oh, Next neat. question. Neat. Okay, so Ashley Fermento asks, uh, I grew up one of those people within sight of the river, the Delaware in Philadelphia and protested the I-95 ramps that much later removed the train tracks and historic piers. What was your experience with port cities? Oh, that's such a good question. Remember that like we've been on the inland waterways. And so um, typically we never see port cities. I mean, there are, I mean, is like Pittsburgh, is that a port city? I mean, it has like yeah. shipbuilding and whatnot, right? Um, but we've, we haven't ever taken, we haven't ever followed a river all the way to the ocean ocean, right? We come close, but not quite. Um, but there are big cities that we've been in. Um, actually, I just lied, I'm sorry, I forgot. There is one port city we've been to, New York City, right? So uh, I was told that you guys would like the story that we came down the Hudson um, to the GW Bridge, and then we crossed on the Harlem River where the waves were huge because we misjudged the wind and tide and then all the way down to the East River and then to Newtown Creek. And then we squatted under the Pulaski Bridge for about two weeks. So that was an experience I'm sure all of you have had at one time or another, uh, squatting under the Pulaski Bridge and coming up, popping up in Queens and uh, having pierogies and stuff. Um, so, uh, so what was your experience with Port City? Yeah, what was my experience with Port City? I don't know. To answer the question you wish they'd asked uh, is what I learned when I worked in PR. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my experience is limited. So I, I would love to talk to you because then I can hear your experience about Port Cities, but this is a less... I can, I can um, get Ashley to... It'd be great. I'd her, love to hear stories. Give you her story. I mean, that's, um, what, that's what this project is about, is about you guys... The people here represent so much, so many stories about rivers, about waterways. Um, if you live in New Jersey or you live in New York or you live in Maryland, you are awash with waterways, right? And those stories are intensely interesting to me. Like, how did those affect your life, right? I, I will be sure to let everyone know how to reach out to you when I send the recording. Um, I think we have a final question here. How does astronomy influence your shanty experience? <laughs> that is a, I feel like it's a trick question. Yeah, I think um, this is uh, from Megan Shackney and she is, yeah. Wants Megan. To know how, how does astronomy um, influence your shanty experience? Astronomy, well, uh, let us say that sitting out on the shanty boat when we're docked away from cities. So we have these intense days that are all about interviewing people, right? And so interviewing people is this process. I'm looking at them, I'm nodding sagely, right? I'm listening, I'm making notes in my head of questions I wanna ask. I'm trying to really hear what they have to say. It's a really 
tiring process. And at the end of maybe four, three or four interviews, I'm like, stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, I'm kind of like a secret introvert uh, or uh, that, you know, I'm like functionally, I can communicate with people, but then I really need some time to recharge. And so we have these days that are very much like town days where we're really interacting intensely with people. And then we have these days in between towns where we drop an anchor, go up a little creek somewhere, make fabulous food. Um, ask me, by the way, about the food on the boat. That's a good. That's a good question. I like to talk about. I like good. I like good food, as uh, you might tell. Um, and in those quiet spots, away from the quiet, away from the noise, away from the city lights, sitting out on the deck and watching the stars is a sublime experience. And so that is the degree to which astronomy intersects our journeys. Um, so we have I, I, another question popped up that I will ask. Uh -huh. I don't wanna keep everyone too long, but so Pamela Benchin said, I got to see the Dottie while you were at Waterford, New York, three or four years ago, both underway and at the dock during the steamboat meet. Very interesting, thanks for this program. Oh, that's awesome, Pamela. It's good to virtually see you again. Um, yeah, the, the, so Waterford, New York, um, was a, one of those fabulous there towns. She is, that, is, she is, there. Um, one of those places that just like, we meet these, we go to these little towns and, and it always surprises us how much the character of the town comes through in just a day's visit, right? And Waterford was one of those places that was really intensely friendly and people were so uh, fabulous and they hosted this steamboat meet. And so you're thinking like, woo, woo, you know, like, uh, you know, queen of the something, right? These are these tiny little, like two, three, four person boats powered by antiquated steam motors where like they literally will have a stack of firewood on the back of the boat to feed into the burner. Um, and we were invited, not a steamboat, we were such, such posers with our little outboard gasoline outboard motor, um, but they, uh, they were kind enough to accept us and we got to hang out with the steamboaters and enjoy water for New York. It was great. This is like super typical of our experience where we're just like wander in and get to take part in like whatever they're doing, you know, like fireworks in, uh, um, uh, where was that place in Ohio? Murrieta, Ohio, right? Or um, just, we just wander into things at different places and it's fabulous. Okay, so um, this, this is really gonna be the last question. So the really last question is why the name the Dottie? Oh, that's such a good question. It's named after my grandma. Uh, my grandma was named Dorothy, um, who I called Honey, because my grandpa called her Honey. So I thought that was her name. Um, and she was a person who could not go down a road and pass a dirt road that disappeared into the distance without turning down that dirt road to find out where it went. And so to some degree, my sense of adventure, um, I can blame it on my fifth grade librarian, but also my grandmother is also responsible. Um, ironically, she hated the name Dottie, um, but Dorothy seemed a little too highfalutin for our tiny little shanty boat so i went with donnie um i'm gonna ask my own question what do you guys eat on that boat do you just is it all like burger king and uh you know der wiener schnitzel um we eat very very well on the boat we have a full kitchen as you saw from the photos um and so uh i'm looking at we have we actually have running water so we turn a little thing and water comes out um that we keep in the a tank in the bow and um one of my favorite experiences once when we, uh, on our last field work, we were camped out on the Little Miami River off of the Ohio, and um, we had bought uh, um, eggplants from like one of those like super Walmart stores. And the, the clerk at the, at the counter was like, what are these? I've seen these, but I don't even know what they are. And I said, they're eggplants. And she said, how do you use them? And I said, well, you can bread them and fry them and you could make something like eggplant parmesan, which I had the intention of doing, even though we don't have an oven on the shanty boat. And so I fried up my eggplant and, and I made, layered it with cheese and sauce and stuff and in a cast, 
cast iron pan in a casting and then had a lid for it and then just let it slow cook for a long time and made delicious eggplant parmesan um so there you are we eat really well we start our day with cheesy grits and bacon and eggs and and uh uh yeah nobody goes hungry when you're on the shanty boat dotty that is so awesome thank, thank you guys you. so much yeah thank i really appreciate so the question. and debbie thank you so much and um it's been a pleasure and thanks and to the board members who helped make this happen who uh are on board here and uh i really appreciate the museum and i'm looking forward to visiting when i'm in new jersey yep we got to get you out to princeton and and everyone will get a recording from today um and any other questions that you have please feel free to email me and i'll be sure that wes gets them so thank you again everyone have a wonderful evening and hope to see you thank you guys so much it's a pleasure